Well, it's martini time again. Here we are on a beautiful Saturday in Blackstone, Virginia, the center of the universe, but then you too are the center of the universe. So let's talk about, well, first I've gone back to a lemon twist in my martini. Uh, my uncle was a martini priest and he said, gin, lemon twist, little bit of vermouth. But then I kind of like backslid. Maybe I became a protestant instead of, <laughs> so he's a martini priest, you know. So I became a protestant and had an olive. But then I began to see the metaphor in the lemon twist. Because a lot of what I write on Facebook is a lemon twist. A twist is a twist, an unexpected twist. I thought it was, when I first started fixing his martinis, I thought it was a lemon slice. But my daughter, who had been a bartender, showed me, no, it's a lemon twist. You peel off a uh, twist of lemon peel. You don't put a slice in there, you put a twist of the peel. So it's a twist, you know, and that's a metaphor. I dig that, I dig that, you see, a little twist. And a lemon twist means a little sour, you know, a little... Mm, a little, little, little sour there, see. But it's good. You need sour. So anyway, Friday night, so we watched a movie, Friday night movies, and I watched Blazing Saddles. Of course, this is reversed. But then, metaphorically, if you remember Blazing Saddles, <clears throat> it was a lemon twist, and it was a reversal. Mel Brooks movie, I think it was 19... So, looking on the back here, in the 70s, 74, 76, somewhere in there. The greatest uh, ironic movie ever. Uh, Mel Brooks, <clears throat> still alive. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Jews always made the best comics because they are an ironic people. They understand irony. To the Jews, God is ironic. Life is ironic. It's always a surprise. It always comes out different than you expect. That's what irony is. It's a expectational shift. You expect this, you get that. How ironic. <laughs> that's life. And that's Mel Brooks's movie, The Blazing Saddle. So what he does there, he takes the uh, I know you've seen it. If not, you ought to see it again. But he takes the uh, classic American myth, the Western myth of the uh, uh, Western savior, the Western, the cowboy who comes into the town and restores order and then leaves off into the sunset. You see, shame. Uh, all of the Western. This is the two myths in American culture that shape us as Americans, that are uniquely ours. That's what, that's what a cultural myth is. Every culture has its own story. Every culture has its own unique mythic framework of their lives and their data and how to, the information and who they are and how they relate to people and what's the meaning of life. Who am I? What's my country? What's the meaning of my country? Who am I? What's my purpose, you see? The myth provides, the, our stories provide this. Our personal stories fit into our collective stories, like Russian nesting dolls. So, the two myths that he tackles here is the Western myth of the hero savior who comes in from the wild. See, the cowboy that comes in to save the town lives out in the beyond the pale. He lives beyond the pale. Uh, maybe he's in the mountains. I don't know where he lives, but he's a wanderer. Maybe he's a, a retired gunslinger who's given up his karma, but is called again to come in with his guns and restore order, you see. So he's a reluctantly Shane. He has his gun in a trunk, and the, and the farmers are at war with the ranchers, and they're losing, and, and the ranchers are bad. There's a moral authority here. So Shane exercises moral authority. He gets out his gun and he goes in and shoots the bad guy and then rides off into the sunset. 
you see. Doesn't stay in the town. He's a mythic figure. So Reagan mythic comes in on the horse to save the world. We all have it. It's all everywhere, you know. Of course, this fits into the Christian myth, too, of the Christ Savior, you see. But what's the other myth? The Confederate myth, the myth of the Romantic South, the romance of the South, the Old South, the heritage, the men on the horse sitting in the park, kind of like brings those together, the generals of the lost cause, you see, the valiant romantic heroes of the South, and the who who you know who who um, fought for their land against the evil North, the Yankees, you see, the stormtroopers, the hordes, you see, the true humans, the true people, uh, the true the natural man, the true man, the true American, fought off against the 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 imperial forces of that drunken Grant and. Uh, the, the armies made up of uh, immigrants and foreigners and uh, machines and all, you know, it's all played, Star Wars, it's all played out. So Mel Brooks takes these two myths and just destroys them through irony. So how does, how does irony destroy a myth? Well, therapy does the same thing. If you're caught up in a polarity in a relationship and you and your spouse or your friend or the world are just at war all the time and you hate the other person, the enemy, you can't love the enemy, reverse roles, the therapist says. Uh, pretend, you're the, pretend you you are your partner. Reverse the roles and see what happens. Reverse the roles. So Mel Brooks reverses the roles. He makes a black man the west the sheriff. <laughs> the, the rancher or the crook, played by Har Harvey Coleman, uh, wants to get the land uh, from the town so he can put the railroad on it. This was a typical war: the railroaders against the town, the ranchers against the farmers. All this, the west was played out in these polarities. And it was always the Western hero, uh, the gunslinger, the gun, comes in and restores balance, you see. So what does he do? He flips the, he flips the, <laughs> he flips the myth, he flips the polarity, and, and the uh, Harvey Coleman thinks he can uh, get the land, uh, get the people off the land uh, by sending in a Trojan horse. Instead of sending in a sheriff who will protect the town, he'll send in a black guy and <laughs> as the sheriff, thinking, well, they'll lynch him. <laughs> so, so he goes in and, and he hooks up with uh, uh, the Waco kid, <laughs> played by uh, uh, Gene, uh, well, I can't think of his name. Uh, uh, and he's so fast you can't even see his hands move. <laughs> he's, he's such a fast gunslinger that <laughs> he shoots <laughs> and he can't even see him move. So anyway, the thing unrolls and, and the, uh, uh, the railroad men enlist all of the Ku Klux Klan and the, and the Nazis and the, uh, of all of the... Uh, <laughs> they enlist all the fascists and all of the bigots and everybody, you know, on their side. And so then they go in to uh, destroy the town. And so the, uh, our blacks just, <laughs> and another neat thing what Mel does is, 70, you know, he, I mean, he, he uses the word nigger in it, you know, all over the place. And, uh, and I can't even, you know, the, you can't even, even today, uh, that's a forbidden word, you know. So anyway, uh, so, <laughs> so, the, so the black guy uh, gets the town and uh, they put up a false town. And the ranchers come in and they start destroying the false town. And then they figure out it's a ruse, it's a false town. And then they start fighting with the town. And then here's the, here's the classic thing, the coup de grace, is that they break through the set and they fall into the movie, st the studio fighting the town and the, and the ranchers, you know. And it's just a roaring mob fight, you know, and they fall into the set. And then the movie set, and interrupt the movies. And then they fall into the... Uh, t into the theater, and then they fall into the town. They just keep spilling into one set after another. 
and then <laughs> and then it resolves back to the town and the, and the re and balance is restored and the black hero and Waco ride off into the sunset you see <laughs> so what did he do there he kind of like showed us that we're all living in a movie we're all living myth is a movie this the confederacy it's a movie it's gone with the wind we're still living in gone with the wind frankly Charlotte I don't give a damn you know <laughs> we're all living in our myths so you got the rich the myth of the uh, the white hero in the south and you got the myth of the white hero in the west and they just come together and make one big hell of an American movie and the, and everything that happens gets interpreted in reference to our myths and we can see it going on today don't take down my statues it's just stone if you have any value in that it's because of the myth it's because your investment in the story of it my heritage well yeah it's the heritage of racism <laughs> so you're right it is heritage you see but everything in the myth is a polarity myths are held together by a polarity of the good guy and the bad guy. Wrestling is a myth. Wrestling is a polarity held together by the morally good guy and the morally bad guy. Morality is a myth. Morality holds together a good and a bad, and they're both equal. And they know, and it just keeps repeating itself, you see. And we're doing that now. You can see it right now. So it's all people on Facebook. I love Facebook. There are, people are thinking. People are looking at this mm. oh, excuse me for slurping people are confused what the hell's going on what the hell's going on you see where is the peaceful America where is the threat I mean we're uh, I mean everybody I just I just went and bought some chicken nobody shot at me I'm here in town and black my door is open. There's no rioting out there, you see. Uh, I leave, you know, I leave the house. I we're pretty safe. Everything is calm. And yet we're the media is raging, you see, with killings and terrorists and attacks, you see. We got all this what is going on, you see? They're marching in the streets. For what? <laughs> For what? For the story of it, for the myth of it. We're in a, we live, we have been. Now I, you know, now I come here and I share my, my explorations with you. I share my questioning. I share my looking because that's all I do. I look and I write and I see. And I see from, I'm 80 years old and I see from a long stretch of history, you see. So I hope what I see from this overlook over the valley of our present moment, of our land, uh, has a value to, do, to you since I have been looking at it for 80 years. Well, maybe not all 80 years, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. So I have a little perspective. And every generation acts out the same story in different clothes. You see. Of course, the fascists, the Nazis who marched in Charlottesville, think they're the Western hero. They think they're saving the world. You see. So anyway, everybody thinks they're saving the world. But it's a, it's a polarity. So a myth is a polarity of two, um, well, there you go. That's, that's the structure of a myth, of a story. The good guy against the bad guy. But each is mutually dependent upon the other. And the two make up a whole. So you can't take one without the other. Because they are mutually dependent. If you take, if you take the black guy out, if you take the black out, the, white, the, the seed of the white is in the black. And if you remove the black, you can't because its seed is in the opposite. So each is, op, each is seeded by its opposite. That's what mutually dependent means. You can't... You can't take, you can't remove one and think you're going to have all white. 
or all black or whatever or all good or all up you think you can have just up and no down if you think you think you can have a battery with just positive and no negative no the battery is generates energy because it contains the positive and the negative so these uh, polarities these mythic polarities of the good I'm the good guy against the bad guy generates karmic energy and they enliven us they make us go march they make us vote they make us get up and move you see I'm energized I'm outraged if you're outraged that's a good that, that's a good sign you are in a mythic polarity you're outraged over you outrage doesn't mean you're doing anything or seeing anything it just means you're all riled up for what you see just I love being riled up I feel like I'm doing something when I'm riled up you see you know but it's all part of the myth you see so the myth is a polarity of opposites that generates the energy that kicks kicks it down the road that's called karma the groundhog day it's kicked down the road to reform itself in reenactments in the future with new generations dressed in new clothes so we are deceived and we think it's something new now civil war reenactments and uh, I live here in Blackstone and if anybody lives in the civil war it's me I live on Lee's retreat I live in between Appomattox and Petersburg pretty close Petersburg was the year-long site of the first trench warfare like the First World War Pre Petersburg was a precursor of World War one the two armies were entrenched and they just killed each other for a whole year neither one could move a perfect a stalemate finally Grant was able to cut off enough supplies to starve Lee to death that he had to break out they cut off the railroad so Lee had to break out and he was going to get to the mountains where he could regroup and continue the war after four years keep this thing going couldn't stop it could not stop it so Lee took off and and when I go to I just went to crew to get some chicken for my dinner because my wife went to Rotary and that's I get to stay home and have fried chicken <laughs> talk to you so all along the way here from Blackstone to Farmville and on to Appomattox which is just a little bit past Farmville <clears throat> you can follow Lee's retreat <clears throat> you can follow the wounded bear turning and snarling at the hounds of Grant <laughs> but he's limping off finally he's cornered at Appomattox and he quits and hands over his sword you see you'd think the war would end but the myth continues the myth keeps rising again see I was just reading an article about Grant how how he's kind of like uh, Lee is raised up and Grant as Grant is put down Lee is the noble warrior Grant's the drunk well that's not history you see so anyway the reconstruction that would have uh, Grant Hope would have healed the war uh, was dropped and the South rose again and in the 20s all these statues were raised again put on pedestals Jim Crow started the blacks were lynched in droves picnics white people right here around here Farmville I mean the Ku Klux Klan there were you know cross burnings you know in the South the lynchings were picnics you know so just like blazing saddles the movie rises again and now it's rising again you see it keeps coming back blazing saddles and so we're living in a continuous movie and more so now I think because for since the 50s I know I got we got our first TV in the 50s 
I remember going to a friend's house in 1950. I think I saw my first TV at a friend's house and watched Howdy Doody through a little bitty screen that big. But then we got our TV and and uh, 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 everybody that that changed everything. Now we've been living in TV, in the image of TV now since the 50s. Generations have grown up. The baby boomers who are now, I taught them in high school. The baby boomers now are retiring and they grew up on TV. We live in TV. We think we're living in TV, in a movie. We really do. And movies are made of stories. Movies are created, movies are electronic myths. Joseph Campbell said movies are our myth makers, you see. So we live in these movies. We think we have life as a movie today. And we look at what's going on and it's almost like people think it's a video game. Oh yeah, oh yeah, well atomic war, well how, you know, that's not too bad, you know. Well Trump says, uh, well why can't we use some nukes? You know, why can't we uh, play around with uh, the, the end of time and the destruction of life? Why can't we uh, fool around with this? It looks like a pretty fun game. The destruction of the earth. You know, I mean, that would be a surprise. I'm kind of bored. I want a surprise. That's the problem with TV, is that you get bored with what you got. You got to have a new surprise. You got to have a new movie. You got to have a new sitcom. You got to have something new. I've been watching this. This is reruns. I want something new. But it's still all the same movie, the same plot, the same pattern. So anyway, Blazing Saddles was a great, ironic lemon twist, you see, which flipped the role so you could see the absurdity, the absurdity of living in these gone with the wind myths and the western hero, those two myths, gone with the wind and the western hero, you see. That's America, and these myths get replayed in different ways over and over and over again, and we fall for it every time. We, we get all riled up, and we fall for it, and we go to war. On Facebook, an opinion war, reshooting the Civil War. Opinions are our bullets, and we fire at each other across the posts. <laughs> I'm wounded. That's an, I'm offended. I'm offended. Oh, you just shot me, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm offended. It's all, it's all movie. <laughs> Thanks for dropping in. I hope you can laugh with me. <laughs> <laughs>